Okay, yep. So today we'll be talking about energy conservation, um, talking about strategies that can just keep you going all day, whether that would be, you know, just your daily activities like getting dressed um, to things that are a little bit harder, like making a good meal for the family, um, all the way up to just being able to go to the doctor's appointments or whatever that you need to do. So um, this was, this presentation was put together, you can go to the next slide, sorry, Angie, um, put together by uh, from the Minnesota team. Just So personally, I am from the Minnesota team. I'm Angie's counterpart, as she said, in Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota. So I help support our care services team over here. Um, and my background is OT. So like Angie said, I worked in occupational therapy for about 20 years prior to coming into the ALS Association. And my main role in that time was as an occupational therapist for Fairview Home Care, which is our largest home care agency here in Minnesota. Um, and I I presented a lot of en on energy conservation for a lot of different diagnoses, but ALS tended to be one of the main ones. So, um, so when we're looking at energy conservation, we really are looking at fuel for our body, but not fuel in the way that we look at it. So if you look at a typical definition of energy conservation, um, Wikipedia says energy conservation is the effort made to reduce consumption of energy by using less of an energy service, it can be achieved either by using energy more efficiently or reducing the amount of service used. Um, energy conservation is a part of the concept of eco-sufficiency. Oxford Dictionary is very similar, a little bit more um, subtle, the prevention of wasteful use of energy, especially in order to ensure its continuing av availability. So if we're thinking about energy, what were you thinking of? Um, when it came to ways that you conserve your energy. So I think a lot of those points, even knowing they're related more to sustainable energy, we're looking at things that as related to our body. So we wanna look at ways to reduce the consumption of energy that we use throughout the day. Um, we wanna be able to use our energy more efficiently so that we can do the things that we want to do. Um, we want to reduce the amount of service used. So we wanna, again, you'll always hear that phrase, work smarter, not harder. So we just wanna really be able to do the things that we wanna do, but try to do them in a way that we're not overextending ourselves. Um, <clears throat> and preventing wasteful energy. What, what does our energy really need to be spent on and what don't we wanna spend it on? And then just making sure that we can continue its availability. So how do we do that? And what does that mean for you if you want to, <clears throat> yeah. So just kind of reflecting on that quick, were you right like about what, energy conservation is and how it related to you. Um, I don't know, a lot of you probably have had some sort of fatigue, whether related to ALS or just generally life in general. So um, I want you to, if you can, Angie, switch to the next slide about what does this mean for you? So, um, oh, sorry, I kind of went over all those. I didn't realize that it was an automated slide. <laughs> um, so what does it mean for you? So do you have enough energy right now? Um, if you think about your day-to-day -day activities right now, do you feel like you have enough energy where you get to the end of the day and you feel like, yeah, I can sit and read a book or I can sit and enjoy a show with my family? Or are you getting to the end of the day and feeling um, like you could fall asleep at the dinner table? Those are the types of things that you really need to watch out for. Um, and really start to judge what is what is enough activity, what too much activity, and what's just right. So, all right, and I will have you switch to the next screen. Um, so as I said, I mean, not sure if um, most of you can think now or we'll have room for stories and questions later, but there is some component to ALS that causes fatigue. and. We can't predict the course of ALS for most people, but we can pretty much predict that everybody with ALS is going to experience some form of fatigue. Um, and a lot of that can be related due to the muscle weakness and spasticity. It's just taking a lot of more, a lot more physical energy to do activities. Um, but then we also are going to be dealing with, um, you know, other things like that would cause the fatigue as far as, so you have the physical, but then you also have the mental and your body is just working extra hard to keep up. So you're thinking about it from the standpoint as having ALS, but if we look at the next slide, I want you guys to think about what does this mean for your caregiver too? So 
yeah, you're probably really tired. You're probably doing a lot of things, but all of a sudden too, we have to think about our caregiver at home and our caregiver is doing a lot of things that they never used to do. Like they might now, which may not seem like a lot, but they may now be doing all the vacuuming, all the grocery shopping, those types of things, um, which then makes them more tired. And so we talk about caregiver burnout and we talk a lot about energy conservation for our patients, but we don't always think about the caregivers and the family surrounding that person either. So um, I always like to point that out and talk about that because I think these are strategies that both the individual living with ALS and their families and caregivers can use. So um, Angie, if you want to switch to the next slide. Um, so really burnout, just kind of right along, going along with that just, uh, energy conservation and talking about running out of energy, it can be defined as that exhaustion of physical or emotional strength or motivation, at, usually as a result of prolonged stress. So um, we know in general in the United States that we have a lot of stress. Um, we are in a society that pushes a lot to get things done, not only timely, but um, you know, good, it's got to be perfect, all those things, there's a lot of stress. And then to add a diagnosis of ALS on top of it, just kind of compounds that stress and can cause a lot of fatigue that way too. So um, go ahead and switch to the next slide, Angie. And so what we're talking about, like, why are we exhausted? Again, perfectionism. We have a certain way that we want to do things. So we do it that way. And maybe nobody else can do it as good as us. So we feel like we have to do it. Um, never ending tasks. There's always something to do on the to-do list, right? Um, work overload might be that, you know, right now you're feeling, if you're still working, you're feeling the effects of still working and trying to manage your doctor's appointment, trying to manage all these other things that you're supposed to be doing to keep things moving at home. And then just thinking about, you know, all the extra things that um, your spouse or your caregiver may be dealing with too. They may be still continuing to work full time. They may be now doing extra chores at home that they didn't have to do before. Um, things are changing. So in multiple roles, so roles are shifting constantly causing exhaustion among the family. Um, Self-sacrifice. The time that I used, to, I used to maybe have to myself, now I'm spending doing X, Y, and Z because that's gotta get done. Um, and then unspoken feelings. We don't really sit and chat about why, um, why we are exhausted or what could we do about it or you know, I'm feeling guilty because you're doing so much more than you used to have to do those types of things. So all those things are going through our heads. We're constantly thinking about it. We're constantly thinking about the to-do list. So yes, it gets very exhausting. So the question is on the next slide is what do we do? Um, so over the course of the years, this is something that has been studied pretty extensively. And I think for me personally, as a clinician, I found it really fascinating because this is actually something that we can do something about. So um, I always tell people it's common sense. We don't always use our common sense. So right away, when somebody says to you energy conservation, you have a general idea of what that is. You might not necessarily know how to relate that to yourself, but you have an idea of what it is. We wanna conserve energy so that we don't run out of gas or whatever other fuel to get what we need done. Um, so this has been studied and there are a lot of strategies. So the first one that I used to practice a lot for people was called the four principles. So if you wanna to switch to the next slide, Angie. Um, so these are just the four principles of energy conservation. So honestly, if you have no other strategy for how you're gonna conserve energy, I want you to think about these four principles or what I call the four Ps. Um, and I'll go into each of these a little, in a little bit more detail. Um, but the four principles would be planning, pacing, prioritizing, and positioning. So if we switch to the next slide, um, planning, all of these should go hand in hand too if you use them. So planning is really going to allow us to organize our time and activities to reduce the fatigue that we're feeling. So we can do this through a variety of things. We can make a calendar and space out activities. Um, really look at what does your week look like? How many doctor's appointments do you have? How many appointments do you have for other things? Um, and really trying to like write those down and make sure that you're planning 
how you're going to get there, what you're going to wear, when you're going to take your medicine, are you going to be able to take a nap afterwards or before those types of things. Um, and schedule rest breaks. Know that if you have a doctor's appointment tomorrow at one o'clock, and if it's an ALS appointment, we know that it's going to be a long appointment. Why don't we have you figure out um, where you could rest at clinic? You know, a lot of times in the room, they could let you lay down. We've had people do that at our clinic. Um, but scheduling a rest break so that you can kind of recharge your battery. One heavy activity per day. A lot of people don't think of taking a shower as a heavy activity, but that takes a lot out of us. Um, the warm humidity, if you walk outside on a humid day, if you're having trouble breathing, you feel it take your breath away. That's the same thing that's happening in the shower. And it might not be that you're necessarily feeling like your breath is being taken away, but because of that humidity, it makes it harder to breathe, therefore making it harder to conserve your energy because there's your oxygen levels in your blood. So it's just little things like that, that you want to think about like, okay, I need a shower. A lot of people feel really good after a shower, but how many showers do I really need during a week? I always tell people, if you're not running marathons, you probably didn't need a shower. You could probably do a quick sponge bath or shower every other day or every few days. Um, really just kind of prioritizing what those things are. Um, and then breaking it down. How do I break down a task to simplify it? Like, I, I think one of the main things I used to say to people was like, well, do you have a shower chair? I don't need a shower chair. I'm not going to get a shower chair. That's fine. But that shower chair may be the one thing that simplifies that shower task and makes it bearable for another month or two, because you can sit down and conserve your energy and you're not going to feel as worn out afterwards. And then my favorite is always a good old to, to do list. Um, not for everybody, I know that, but it's good to have a to-do list. Um, all right, and then switching to the next slide, Angie. So pacing, um, pacing is really just making sure that you are giving yourself plenty of time to do what you want to do. So I always tell people, if you are doing that planning ahead, you are definitely going to be able to space your activities out. And if you're using a calendar, you can definitely space activities out. Um, but be honest, you know, be honest with yourself, be honest with other people that things take longer than they used to. I don't, you know, I think even as we get older, I don't necessarily get ready and get out the door and on my way to a doctor's appointment in a half an hour anymore. I have to really plan. All right, I'm going to get up. I'm going to have breakfast. I'm going to sit and rest for a little bit. Then I'll go get dressed, those types of things. So it does just take a lot more planning, but it also allows you to really give yourself the time and the space that you need to get ready. Um, and then also just using an alarm clock. So just like sometimes it's hard to get things started. Sometimes once you get started, it's really hard to stop. So a lot of times people will report that they get into one of their hobbies and they go and go and go and all of a sudden realize they overdid it. Um, sometimes having a, an alarm clock or something to just indicate that you should stop or you'll be feeling it later can be helpful in that case. All right, next slide, Angie. Prioritize. Um, so what really needs to get done and what could wait? So really focusing on your basic human needs here. Um, we need to eat. We need to go to the bathroom. We have some basic human needs that we really need to focus on. Um, and then decide what the other needs are that can be met so that you don't wear yourself out too much. Um, again, to-do list, great. Have a to-do list and delegate it. And I, this is where I really say the caregivers come in sometimes because when you are not feeling well and you're not able to do all the things that you used to do, and as I mentioned, the caregiver a lot of times is picking up some of those extra chores and things at home, it's hard for us to ask for help, especially in the Midwest. I, I don't know if you guys have heard, but that's like a Midwestern thing um, where we have a really hard time asking others for help. And so this is one thing that I always said to the person with whatever it was that I was treating. Um, it may be easier for you to ask for help than your spouse or your significant other. So for example, if I'm battling ALS, and my husband's working full time and he's running around doing everything at home, but I'm realizing how tired he is. He would never be the one to say, I need help. I would have to say it for him. So what I used to ask 
couples or families to do would be to write a to-do list that they both felt comfortable asking for help with. So that could be dropping off a gallon of milk, running the Swiffer over the floor when somebody stopped by, um, throwing a load of laundry and dropping off some groceries, it, whatever it is that you guys feel comfortable asking for help with. And then if people do ask for help, because people ask because they really do want to help. They don't ask because they're just offering. They want to actually help, but they don't know what to help with. And if you don't really have a good list of things that they could help with, they may not be as receptive to helping either. So if I know that I have a list and you tell me that I could run to the store and pick up something and drop it off at your house in a half an hour, I might be apt to sign up for that. So um, just some things to think about there. And then also just thinking about who cares. If it's not something that you're going to remember, whether you scrub the floor on your hands and knees or with a mop, I don't think anybody else cares either. So you sometimes just have to kind of talk some sense into yourself too. I, I had a lot of people that really required that they scrub the floors on their hands and knees. And I, that, that was their reasoning and they did it as long as they could, but they eventually, you know, we would just talk about who cares if it gets done and it's clean, who cares how it's done, so. Um, all right, next one, positioning. So this one is a little bit more basic. Um, you wanna look at yourself and your surroundings. So if you are not positioned properly in your chair or in your bed, you are gonna have more difficulties um, getting comfortable, breathing, all those things can reduce your energy. So you wanna make sure that you are positioned optimally. Um, and that can be working with your therapist at clinic or you know any home care therapist about ideas about how to position in your chair or in your bed. Um, keeping your essentials close by, I always say have a hub, have a little hub that you know, all right, this is my chair, this is where I'm spending my day, I'm gonna have my remote, I'm gonna have a glass of water, I'm gonna have all those things around me that I could possibly need so that I don't have to run around and get them when I want them. Um, and then use your planning strategies. Like when I get up, you know, in a half an hour, I'm going to get up for lunch. I have to remember to get a blanket because I was cold, you know, so really kind of trying to plan the next trip to the kitchen. What, what other things could you do at that point? Um, and then avoiding multiple trips up and down the stairs. So I would always, my husband kills me. He, he it just kills him actually that I live in a two-story home and I will keep stuff on the top of the stairs to bring down when I come down and I'll keep stuff on the bottom of the stairs to bring up when I go up. But that is my OT in me. Why a wasted trip, never waste a trip. So um, yeah, and even a backpack or something, if you feel like you need to be able to haul things up and down but can't safely do that, I would have people use backpacks quite a bit, so. Um, all right, so activity number one, I just want you guys to think about, again, um, either yourself or who you live with, is there a list of activities that you guys feel comfortable asking for help with? Um, and this was just kind of an example list of something that I put together uh, that my husband and I would feel comfortable asking for people to help with if they had a couple of minutes or felt like they could do that. So, all right, next slide. Um, I wanna make sure that you guys have this and you can reach out to one of your care services um, team members, but ALS Care Connection is a um, simple online calendar tool that you can use to organize a community, community of people to help you. So again, kind of coming down to that delegating of task, um, this is something that it, you can go online, we can help you set it up, but on the calendar, you can put different things that need to be done and then people can sign up when they're available to it. And it also can give them a reminder. So um, if Angie, if you switch to the next page, I can kind of show an example of what that is. Um, so on the Care Connection calendar, you can see that, um, it was something that our volunteer manager and I were playing around with, but she had um, put up like a target list. Like we wanted somebody to go and do like a pickup at Target and it could be done anytime during the day. So you can see over, this is a little old, um, but in November of 21, I needed a Target pickup 
almost every day that week. Or nope, I did it once a week for three weeks. Um, but then anybody who has a connection to this calendar can go on and sign up. So I went on and I signed up and said that I was gonna do a target run for this family one day. And then I get a text reminder. It was, it was great. Um, and you can have an organizer in here that can go in and make sure that all the shifts are filled, that the shifts are filled in, um, contact people if they need to, whatnot. So usually there will be one volunteer to kind of take that on, so. All right, next page. Um, this is another theory that I heard about from a patient that I had um, in home care. And actually, she did not have ALS. She actually had a really rare autoimmune disease, but um, also had a newborn baby and just got really, really tired. And she was telling me about this theory and it really made a lot of sense to her. And I have since shared it with many patients and many um, friends, and they all say that this is a great technique too. So. Um, we'll go ahead and switch to the next slide, Angie. Um, so this, I'm not going to read all of this to you, but this is from the author, Christine, um, and she has lupus. And so she was trying to explain to somebody, one of her friends, what having lupus meant and what it felt like to not have enough energy um, that you wanted. So when you are you know, a normal, healthy adult, you wake up and you do not even think about how much energy you need to get through your day. So, um, but when you are starting to get sick or feel a loss of something, that energy gets expended a lot differently. So she came up with the spoon theory. Um, and actually, I'm going to ask you, Angie, to switch to the next slide and go back. And I'll just ask the question. Um, and so if you can go past that to the next slide. Okay, so the spoon theory, if you wanna think about your day starting out with 12 spoons and each spoon um, represents an activity or multiple spoons can represent an activity. So you can see on this slide here, just getting out of bed is one spoon. Getting dressed is one spoon taking our pills is one spoon and watching TV is one spoon. So for the majority of us in this group today, we probably have at least spent four spoons. So I want you to kind of take a minute and think about how many spoons do you think you use today? And if you have any spoons left to get you through, let's say if you go to bed at 10 o'clock at the next eight hours of the day. And Angie, I know we're recording. So do we wanna have people share at the end, do you think? Yeah, we can share at the end when we go around. Okay, perfect. I think we should do this. I think this is kind of a very eye-opening activity. Yeah, we at the end we can bring this slide up um, after we stop recording and then ask again. Perfect. Okay. Um, okay, so that's one theory. Uh, so now we have the four principles. We have the spoon theory, and then now there's just the activity scale. Um, you know, a lot of people are like, "I'm not going to sit and count spoons all day." That just seems really silly. So one other thing you can do is just rate everything on a scale of one to three. So. Um, you would just, you know, kind of say like this activity requires, it's easy for me to do. I can do that. That would be a one. Uh, I, again, I can do a couple hours. That would be a two. And then that activity is going to wear me out. You can just rate that on a three and just kind of see how things are going from that, um, standpoint. All right. So next steps, I want you guys to really think about the information that we went over today, process the information and think about how would you manage your energy levels? Would you use any of the theories we talked about today? Um, do you feel like they would be helpful in budgeting your energy going forward? I would um, really try to encourage people to make a to-do list, especially with your significant other or your primary caregiver. And then the things that I want you guys to think about for your calendars is um, making a list of all the activities that you participate in, your appointments, um, 
even yourself, your daily activities, like your self-care medication, because those all take energy, list of all your weekly activities, monthly activities. And I want you, your biggest challenge is I want you to make sure that you are including fun things because we all need to do a little bit of fun. And a lot of times when it comes down to that, we don't put the fun things in because we feel like we need to put our energy somewhere else, but that can also be energizing for you. All right, um, next up. And then also I want you guys to consider the Care Connections um, calendar and just really taking all those steps that you did previously to talk about how you're gonna like balance your, your calendar out for the week. Um, if you need more information on energy conservation, definitely talk to your OT and PT at clinic. They should have a lot of resources for you um, or help you break down a task if you're really struggling with something. So with 